Okay, fantastic turnout today. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, happy spring break. The week after spring break, two weeks from today, former mayor of San Francisco, current lieutenant governor of California, Gavin Newsom, will be here in two weeks. Phenomenal speaker. Um, so definitely be here for that. And speaking of Harvard, just a second ago, I am really honored to introduce, we have Professor Larry Lessig from Harvard here today. <laughs> 30 years, our first Harvard professor. And to be honest, when I was told um, we had the opportunity to have a professor from Harvard speak to the class, I said, we have 750 people in here, not 75. The idea of having a Harvard law professor is not what Poli Sci 179 is all about. And I thought my audience will not appreciate this, so I, I kind of just dismissed the idea. Then I saw a video of Professor Lessig speaking, and I was blown away by this. And I immediately thought, man, I'd love to enroll in his class or vote for him for president or something like that. <laughs> just tremendous, and you're in for a real great experience today. He is currently the director of the Edmund Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard. And, okay. and teaches at the Harvard Law School. Prior to teaching at Harvard, you know the last couple of weeks we've had Stanford graduates at our class, which you've been so happy to have. He did not go to Stanford. But he taught at Stanford Law School. How about that? So, but he's at Harvard now. And he taught at University of Chicago also. Um, where he, and at Stanford he founded the... Um, Center for Internet and Society. He's a graduate of Penn. Any Penn fans out there? You? He, he received a master's over at Cambridge in England, those of you. And, and then received his JD at Yale. And now he's at Harvard. Please welcome Professor Larry Lessig. Okay, so I have three ideas on the way to an argument about what you need to do. Idea number one, root striker. So in 1846, 3,076 miles if you walk from here, in Walden Pond, Massachusetts, this man, Henry David Thoreau, wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Root striker. That's the first idea. Number two, independence. So Americans, when they think about independence, are likely to think about 1776, independence from the British. That was a great idea. I grant you that. But that's not the independence I'm talking about here. I want you to think about the independence that most Americans were thinking about around 1786 when most thinking Americans began to recognize that America was a failure. That a certain lack of independence, a kind of improper dependence, had grown up in the state governments across the country. A dependence which, as Jefferson described it, begets subservience and venality, suffocates the germ of virtue, and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. This is what government had become. And what they sought were non-dependent, independent governments that could give the right answer for the right reason. Their common aim were institutions or constitutions against improper dependence. But what it means to be against improper dependence is to be for a proper dependence. So think, for example, about what we mean by an independent judiciary. What we don't mean by an independent judiciary is a judiciary that does whatever the hell it wants. That's not the ideal of independence. What independent judiciary means is a judiciary which is dependent upon the law. Not dependent upon politics, not dependent upon money, but dependent upon the law, guided by the law, by a proper dependence upon the law. That's what independence means here and elsewhere. That's idea two. Here's idea three. Think about trust. I want you to see the way trust is a function of independence. <laughs> 
It's a function of the right kind of dependence. So think, for example, about this chemical. I'm sure the chem majors here know what this is, right? Bisphenol A, otherwise known as BPA, a chemical that's in most of the plastic that most of us touch all the time, consuming our bodies with its effects, which some people say is unsafe, but many people wonder whether it is, in fact, safe. Most of us are sure it's safe. I mean, how could the government ever allow such an unsafe chemical in our environment, right? So most of us are confident we must be living with a safe chemical everywhere around us. But in fact, the research here is contested and contested in a particularly interesting way. If you distinguish between industry-funded studies of BPA and independently funded studies of BPA, and between studies that find harm and studies that find no harm, the pattern is disturbing. All of the industry-funded studies find no harm, while the vast majority of independently funded studies find harm. Whatever your view of BPA was, you are now less sure about its safety than you were before. Or think about cell phones, right? Are cell phones safe? These microwave emitting devices you put within an inch of your brain. 70% of you think, of course they're safe. You're like smokers in the 1960s. How else could they be anything but safe? We couldn't live life without a cell phone. Therefore, they are safe. But here again, the research is contested and contested in a way which should trouble you if you're concerned about your brain. The vast majority of independently funded studies find a biologic effect from this microwave uh, radiation near your brain, and the vast majority of industry-funded studies don't. Whatever your view was before, now you are less sure than you were before. The point is that the confidence that you have in these products or chemicals is affected by the presence of money in the relationship between the studies and their results. And we've studied this more generally. We took a Random sample of normal people, well, Harvard undergrads, but okay, they're sort of normal people. Um, and we had them evaluate a series of vignettes where all that differed was whether the underlying actor was affected or could be affected by a financial interest. And what we found was the mere suggestion of a financial interest significantly influenced the participants' trust and confidence for the worse. The point is not that money is a problem. The point is that money in the wrong place creates the problem. And the lesson here is that to maintain confidence, to maintain trust in an institution like science or government, we must secure independence for that institution, which means to secure the proper dependence for that institution. That's the third idea. Here's the argument. Think about trust in this institution, Congress, where the lack of trust is profound. Latest Gallup poll found that 11% of the American public has confidence in Congress, right, 11%. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. So why is it people have no confidence in their Congress? Well, I'm going to engage a little bit of brainwashing here to get you to think about this in a particular way. So I'm going to go through some examples to bring you to the view I think you need to hold here. Let's start with copyright. I spent many years as a copyright activist. I began on October 27th, 1998, when Congress enacted a statute in honor of this great American Sonny Bono, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act a statute which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question Congress was supposed to be thinking about when they extended the term of existing copyrights was whether that advanced the public good, right? Copyrights are for the purpose of creating incentives to produce something new. The one thing we know about incentives is that they are prospective. Except on Star Trek, there is no way to create incentives in the past, not even the United States Congress can get George Gershwin to produce anything more. So obviously it could produce no new incentives to create 20 more years of copyright protection for existing works. So when we challenged this statute in the Supreme Court and got a bunch of economists to sign a brief 
questioning the underlying policy choice made by Congress, this liberal economist, oh wait, I'm sorry, this is the right-wing Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman said he would only sign the brief if the word no-brainer was in it somewhere. So obvious was it that you couldn't advance the public good by extending the term of existing copyrights. But obviously there were no brains in this place when the statute unanimously passed the United States Congress. What there was in that place was more than six million dollars in contributions from the Disney Corporation to pass what is otherwise known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. Example number one, example number two. This is a picture of a 12 year old boy. It's a picture of kind of obesity epidemic that is spreading across the United States. Since 1980, Three times the number of children are obese that, what, than were in 1980. Now, children over the age of two, one-third are technically obese. This epidemic has costs. One of the more troubling costs is a rise in type 2 diabetes. Kind of diabetes that used to affect only old people. Now, in some areas, one half of the new cases are cases from kids. $147 billion annually in direct care costs because of this obesity epidemic. Why do we have it? Well, some people think it's related to what we eat. Plausible enough, right? There's a consensus that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. Or actually, not technically sugar. We eat too much of this, high fructose corn syrup. 40% of the products in supermarkets, not in Berkeley, but in other places in the world, 40% of the products have high fructose corn syrup in it. And that leads people to ask, well, why is this sweetener, which 30 years ago literally no one consumed, now 40% of sweeteners in our supermarket? Well, the answer has something to do with price. Sugar is expensive relative to corn. That, le that leads people who are enamored of markets to say, well, if the market says so, then that's what we've got to accept. The market puts high-valued resources where they are most valued, and that's the choice that we must, as policymakers, follow. But it's not quite so simple when sugar ends corn. Sugar is expensive in the United States because we have imposed tariffs on sugar imports. Tariffs, which benefit the sugar industry by about a billion dollars in extra profits every year, and cost the economy about $3 billion because of high-priced uh, sugar sweetener substitutes, which now cost uh, two to three times for sugar in the United States what it cost in any other industrialized nation. And corn in the United States is so cheap because it's subsidized. $74 billion in subsidies in the last 15 years, leading some economists to say the cost of producing corn is actually negative. So you take these two facts about subsidies and tariffs and add them together, and you get a radical shift in the cost of food. So since uh, between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. The cost of the Big Mac went down by 5.4% cost of a bottle of Coke went down by 35%. And that shift in costs also leads to a radical shift in how foods get made. I'm sure many of you saw this film, Food, Inc., which tells the story about how because corn is so cheap, it's cheaper to feed cattle corn than to allow them graze on grass, making factory farms profitable. Of course, not quite so profitable for the poor cows whose stomachs don't digest corn properly. So the only way to feed corn to cows is to also feed them tons of antibiotics to kill off the bacteria that gets filtered through their system, thereby filtering through this antibiotic system an extraordinary number of plentiful and bacteria, bac uh, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And if this were a film, we'd now cut to a story of a three-year-old who ate a hamburger and then died from E. coli poisoning. All of this because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. Now, it leads some people to say, what explains this anti-free market silliness in the basic foodstuffs that we consume? And there are a lot of possible answers to that question, but the one thing we know for sure is the endless amount of campaign cash that's poured into the system to produce these crazy results. So ADM spends literally millions to support the corn subsidy program, and sugar manufacturers and companies like ADM spend millions to support tariffs for 
um, sugar imports. And so you can say if it's because of these campaign contributions, we have campaign contributions distorting the market, which distort food production, which then distort our kids. Example two. Example three. Think about Wall Street. We've just seen the collapse of an economy triggered by Wall Street financial collapse. Why did we see a collapse in financial systems in Wall Street? Well, Simon Johnson and James Quack have a theory in this book, 13 Bankers. They ascribe it to a certain perverse mix, too little government and too much government. So too little government, AKA deregulation. 1990s were filled with these financial innovations, new ways to shift and allocate risk in our markets. But these innovations were invisible to the market because they were exempted from the ordinary rules of transparency that typically govern all other financial instruments in our economy. So as my friend Je uh, Frank Partner calculated, in 1980, before all of this happened, 98% of the financial assets traded in our economy were subject to basic rules of transparency, had to be traded on a public exchange, and anti-fraud requirements attached to those assets. By 2008, 90% of the financial instruments in our markets were exempted from those basic rules of regulation, leading to this extraordinary shadow banking market, which encouraged the production of the bubble that, when it burst, brought down our economy. But that alone, they say, wasn't enough. We also needed a little bit of too much government regulation to explain the collapse that we saw, because through the 1990s, the government signaled these large financial service banks, that there was a government guarantee on the other end of the bubble bursting in the form of a bailout. They would guarantee that when the bets went bad, they would be covered by us, but when the bets went well, they would get all the profits. Leading Krugman to comment that this is a perverse form of socialism. We socialize the risk, but privatize the benefit. We all pay the downside, they get the upside. Now, this is a technical term, but this is an insanely stupid way to run a financial system. So what explains this stupidity? Lots of stories out there. Here's the one thing we know for sure. The fastest growing sector in campaign contributions in the 90s and the, and the aughts was the security sector and just behind it the financial services sector, leading both parties to believe that what these people said was good for America was actually good for America and not just good for the bankers. Or another example, think about this catastrophe, the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. Many people ask, how is it that an experimental drilling well like this could have been built with such environmental impact and risk studies not evaluating effectively what would happen if there was an accident. In my area of the country, we've just spent nine years and 10,000 pages of environmental impact studies to authorize the building of a green energy wind farm in the Boston uh, Harbor um, uh, or Boston Cape. Um, so the question you might ask is, so when they, dealt, when they built this Deepwater Horizon project, what exactly did they have to show the government before they were allowed this massive experiment? And the answer is 17 pages of environmental impact studies before they were exempted from any further requirement to demonstrate the safety of the product that they were producing. Now that leads many in Congress to say they were shocked I'm by shocked, this. I'm shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Every Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required this system of 30-day approvals for these drilling wells. And again, the question is, why would Congress be driven to such a crazy answer for regulating this extremely risky technology? And the answer is, we don't know. There's lots of reasons. But the one thing we know is endless campaign cash driving to that crazy result. Or another example. Think about something you might never have heard of. Here you have heard of it now. Tax extenders. The Wall Street Journal at the end of last year had this story about the fact that there's this rise in the number of temporary tax provisions in our tax code, an explosion, what they call extender mania. In the 1980s, there were basically none. Now we have more than 120 provisions which expire at a certain date requiring Congress to decide whether to extend them. Why do we have the explosion in these extenders? 
Well, the first of these extenders was given us to us by a Californian, Ronald Reagan, in his 1981 tax bill, the Re Research and Del Development Credit. This R&D credit was a tax credit that led many people to believe that the credit would be worth much more than it cost. Um, but many Democrats were skeptical. So the Republicans and Democrats had a compromise. And the compromise was that the extension would, the credit would be temporary. And then after a period of time, they would ask the economists whether it worked. And the economists, both Republican economists and Democratic economists, were unanimous in their view that this credit worked. It was one of the smartest things ever inserted into the tax code. It created an incentive to produce research and development that otherwise would not have been produced. But the puzzle is that this obviously good sense tax credit has never been made permanent in our tax code. Every couple of years it expires. Every couple of years Congress extends it. So why is it this has never been made permanent? Well, as this Professor Rebecca Kaisar wrote in the Georgia Law Review, the simplest way to understand it is to see these extenders as a kind of ATM for congressional campaigns. Because what happens is, as the extension or the credit is about to expire, members have somebody to call and say, you know, we're going to need a lot of support if we're going to get this, ex this credit extended. And so people with millions of dollars on the line are willing to spend a tiny slice of those millions of dollars to help fund the lobbyists and the campaigns that promise to extend it. As she quotes one lobbyist, with the extenders, you know, you always have someone who will help pay the mortgage. You go to the client, you tell them you're going to fight like hell for a permanent extension, but tell them it's a real long shot and we'll be lucky to get just a six-month extension. Then you go to the Hill, strike a deal for a one-year extension. In the end, your client thinks you're a hero and they sign you on for another year. So the lobbyists win and the campaigns win because those who are about to lose the extension spend the value of the extension logically up to the value of the extension to help fund candidates who would extend once again, or think finally about the health care reform, right? Barack went to Obama, Washington and promised to change the way Washington works. And there were some who suggested that after he passed health care, he had in fact succeeded in changing the way Washington works. As Recline wrote this article titled, Twilight of the Interest Groups, as he said, the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry. Now, my view of the same history is it's not quite that simple. My view is closer to Glenn Greenwald. Here's what he wrote. If by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he's absolutely right. <laughs> but being able to force the government to bribe and accommodate you is not a reflection of your powerlessness. Quite the opposite. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked. When we, one can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but one cannot reasonably deny that it was. Suggesting the words of the 20th century's greatest philosopher, David Byrne, same as it ever, same as it ever was, that's the way Washington still is. Now, in each of these cases, all I have to do is point to the money and your trust collapses. And my claim is, number one, it's because of cases like these, not just these, but hundreds of them, that you all believe, quote, money buys results in Congress. Latest polling finds 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. A little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I can guarantee you before the Republicans took over the House, the numbers were reversed. All of us effectively believe money buys results in Congress. That belief, number two, erodes trust in that institution. And number three, we can understand this loss of trust as a function of this improper dependence that has developed within our government. We can understand it, I want to say, as a kind of corruption. A corruption of the intended dependence that our framers had for our democracy. Because our framers gave us what they called a republic. But as the Federalists described, what they meant by a republic was a, quote, representative democracy. 
And that representative democracy had an intended dependence. As Federalist 52 puts it, the democratic branch ought to be that branch of the government that is dependent upon the people alone. So here was the idea they had in mind. I, I do my own graphics. Pretty cool, right? Watch. Boom, right? That's it. Dependent <laughs> upon the people. But the problem is Congress has evolved a different dependency inside of this system. It's not just a dependency upon the people. It's increasingly also a dependence upon the funders. So as Robert Kaiser describes in this extraordinary book, So Damn Much Money, Washington has changed over the last 30 years as the industry of lobbying has risen to play a central role in negotiating the buying and selling of policy. And they can do that because members of Congress spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money so that they can get back to Congress or so that their party can get back into control. And in that process, they develop a sixth sense about how everything they do might or might not affect their ability to continue to raise money. They begin to shape shift in light of what they expect they need to say in order to guarantee the ability to raise money. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told, quote, always lean to the green. And then to clarify, she said, he was not an environmentalist <laughs> who said that. Now the point is this is a dependency too. It's a dependency upon the funders. And it is a different and conflicting dependency from a dependency upon the people. Because here's the obvious fact, the funders are not the people. In the largest study that we have about who actually funds campaigns, we can say that 80% that of people making $75,000 a year or less never give anything to a campaign. And 80% of people making $75,000 a year or more do give money to a campaign, creating this gap between the people, the vast majority of Americans, and the funders. And that gap has consequences. First, policies get bent to benefit the funders. So in the biggest study we've seen of this by Martin Guilens of Princeton, he looked at 1,500 surveys that compared attitudes of the funders, or the top 10% of Americans, and attitudes of the rest of America. And he took 800 of those surveys where the attitudes of the funders were different from the attitudes of most Americans, so where they conflicted. And he asked the question, what did government policy do? Follow the funders or follow the people? And what he found was, when Americans with different income levels differ in their policy preferences, actual policies outcomes strongly favor the preferences of the most affluent, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor or middle income Americans. There's a vast discrepancy between what Congress does and what, quote, the people want Congress to do. So number one, policies get bent and trust decays. 11% is the strongest measure of that decay. Now, this is corruption. It's not Rob Lagojevich corruption. <laughs> it's not the corruption of brown paper bags secreting around cash in quid pro quo bribery. I'm not saying that any member in Congress commits bribery. Indeed, I think from the perspective of quid pro quo corruption, this is the cleanest Congress in the history of Congress. It's not quid pro quo corruption, we could call it independence corruption. It's a corruption of the independence the institution was intended to have. And it functions in plain sight, in plain sight corruption. Because as entities like, I'm sitting on the board of maplight.org, which is a fantastic group to make completely transparent the relationship between influence and outcomes as people produce these kinds of data showing people the relationship between corruption and its results, what that produces is a recognition of how the system works, but how the system works is a corruption of the way the system was intended to work. Now, the same could be said, the same point could be made about the judicial branch at the state level. Courts are supposed to be dependent upon the law. But in state courts, increasingly elections are contested waged in uh, the same way that congressional and presidential elections are. So there develops a gap between the law and the funders. 
2008, $45 million was spent to elect Supreme Court justices in the states. That was seven times the amount spent in 1990. Justice O'Connor has taken it on as her cause to eliminate the election of state court Supreme Court justices. As she says, this produces unprecedented pressure from interest groups, making it hard for the American people to have faith that judges are actually doing the right thing, the thing that makes legal sense, as opposed to the thing that produces campaign dollars. But the sad news for Justice O'Connor is we don't have faith that judges are following the law as opposed to the funders. 76% of Americans believe campaign contributions influence judicial decisions. 70% of judges believe or are concerned that in half of state court cases, contributors are before the judges in the cases asking the judges to decide in their favor in cases where they have contributed. 46% of state judges admit the contributions have at least a little influence on the outcome. Everything's bigger in Texas. In Texas, 79% of lawyers believe campaign contributions significantly influence a judge's decision. So here again, the wrong kind of dependence produces a loss of trust, a corruption, not the brown paper bag kind of corruption, an independence corruption that weakens the effectiveness of the state judiciary. Okay, so that's the argument. You'd summarize it. We have a corruption, I say, not brown paper bag corruption, but independence corruption. Independence corruption produced by an institution with the wrong dependency, a dependency not just on the people alone, but upon the funders. This <coughs> Sorry. This functions in plain sight. It's decent people who engage in this kind of corruption, leading other decent people to ask, how could we fight it? So here's what we should do. It might be the solution to this problem is to fix the dependency, to make the funders the same as the people. So there's no gap between the funders and the people. So the idea that red state Arizona or red and blue state Maine or blue state Connecticut has adopted to fund their elections through small dollar contributions only would be the kind of system that made it so there is no gap between the people and the funders. Now, I have my own vision of the promised land. There's a picture of the promised land. So I'm going to tell you about the picture I have in my head of the promised land for this type of system. We could call it the Grants and Franklin Project. Here's the way it works. First, you have to assume something true, so it's easy to assume. Every single voter produces at least $50 of revenue to the United States Treasury. Not necessarily through income tax, but through gas tax or through cigarette tax or any of the other taxes you pay. You at least produce $50 to the US Treasury. OK, so take the first $50 everybody produces to the US Treasury and set it up in a democracy voucher. A voucher that the voter allowed to allocate however he wants, but only allocate to candidates who promise to take only the voucher and Ben Franklin's, meaning you can also take contributions from citizens up to $100. So you fund your campaign either through vouchers or vouchers plus contributions capped at $100 from any citizen. And if a citizen or a voter doesn't allocate their voucher, then the money goes to the parties. It's a big hole in this theory, because this plan, because there's no independent party. And most, in some states, most people are independent. We have to figure out how to solve that problem. But the point is, the parties get the money as the voter is registered. And that produces support to the parties and also support for small dollar funding. Now, the point is, if this were how elections were funded. $50 a voter is $6 billion. In 2008, the total amount raised and spent in congressional elections was $1.4 billion. So more than three times the total amount spent in 19, 2008 would now be available in congressional elections. And imagine if just 80% of candidates opted into taking vouchers plus $100 in maximum contributions. The point is, if 80% took small dollars only, it would be possible to believe, as we all desperately want to believe, <laughs> 
that when Congress did something stupid, which of course they will, but when they did something stupid, either you'd think it's because there are too many Republicans or because there are too many Democrats, but you wouldn't think it's because of the money. That system would make trust in their decision possible because the integrity had been restored to the decision, a democratic integrity, because the right dependence had been reasserted, the independence of the institution had been achieved. That's the Grant and Franklin's project. Now that's the promised land. The promised land is far away from here. So the question is, how do we get there? And I want to end by giving you three things you need to do. Number one, you all have to become root strikers. You have to begin to be people who identify the connection between whatever the thing is you want to complain about and this underlying root cause. And when you've become a root striker, then number two, you need to teach others about this underlying cause. Because the thing everyone needs to recognize on the right and the left is we get nothing here until we get this. We get none of the changes that we want on the left or on the right, either of them, until we get this. The Obama administration is the story of change on the left being blocked by this system. And when you think about the tax extender story that I told you and you listen to the Republicans talking about a future of simpler, smaller taxes, you can recognize it's impossible to get smaller, simpler taxes or smaller government in a system where the policy makers depend upon complexity and large government to raise the money they need to get back into office. Okay, so become a root striker, teach others, and number three, maybe the most important, uh, you gotta wear Keds. So I'm wearing Keds, look, see? They're cool, they're comfortable. So why do you have to wear Keds? Well, here's the reason. Keds is made by Stride Right. Stride Right was made by Arnold Hyatt. Arnold's a very shy guy. This is the biggest picture I could find of him on the internet. A tiny little picture That's from Massachusetts. Arnold's a loyal Democrat, wealthy man who in 1996 was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. So in 1997, President Bill Clinton decided he would invite the top 30 fat cats to a dinner at the Mayflower Hotel. So these fat cats could tell the president what the president should do in the last years of his administration. This was before the Lewinsky crisis, so they thought there was something he could actually achieve in those last <laughs> years of his administration. So everybody got up and spoke, and Arnold was the last one to speak, and we don't have any pictures of this, but I kind of picture it like this. Arnold stands up to speak to the president. <laughs> and he says to the president, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I want you to put yourself in Roosevelt's shoes in 1939, when Vo Roosevelt reluctantly came to recognize that he needed to, quote, convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Because Arnold said to the president, you too, Mr. President, you too must convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, people like us. People who think that merely because they are wealthy, they are entitled to direct public policy. People who think that merely because they've been successful in the market, politicians have to listen to them, have to answer their phone calls, have to have them to dinner at the White House or the Mayflower Hotel. People who have destroyed democracy by separating Congress and the president from the people so that they focus on the funders. Now you can imagine in this room filled with fat cats and the president after Arnold was finished, there's a little bit of silence as people tried to figure out what to say next. The only published account we have of this evening reports that the president's response, quote, effectively slashed Hyatt to pieces, humiliating him in front of the group. Now, my view is 15 years later, we need to recognize that it was Arnold Hyatt who was right and the president who was wrong, that we do need to convince a reluctant nation 
to wage a war to save democracy. But where Arnold was wrong was in his belief that it was going to be politicians who wage this war. It's not politicians who will wage this war effectively. It's citizens. It's us. It's root strikers. It's you. When Ben Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, he was stopped on the street in Philadelphia by a woman who said to him, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, it is a republic if you can keep it. A republic, a representative democracy, a government dependent upon the people alone. We have lost that republic. You need to join us to help us to get it back. Thank you very much.